Okay, so the people watching on the live stream, you can be a part of this as well. We're going to have a selfie race. So get out your phones. I know Steve told you to put them away early, but all of them out. You need to snap a selfie and then immediately tweet it to the hashtag for this conference. <laughs> now, if you don't have a phone, that's okay. Your job is to bomb someone else's selfie. <laughs> you ready? Go. Keep going. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you can see lots of flashes. The only reason I actually did that is so I can get a selfie from a TED stage. That's pretty much it. No, but seriously, the, the real reason is this. You think about what I've just asked you to do. Okay, so get out your phone and take a selfie and then tweet it to a hashtag and bomb other people's selfies. Now, if I'd have said this seven years ago, <laughs> I probably would have been escorted from the stage. <laughs> but this language, it's a part of our everyday life now, and it's kind of bizarre. It's, selfies are nothing new in, in essence. All they are is just a self-portrait, the first one being from uh, Robert Cornelius in the 1800s. He snapped, well, he didn't snap it. He had to sit there for about a minute to get the selfie. But since that time, Many people have taken self-portraits. So why is it in the last few years that selfies have really taken off? Pardon the pun. Now everyone seems to be doing it. It's not just teenagers, even though we like to think it's just teenagers. I know it's not just teenagers. Everyone's doing it. Celebrities, here's Ricky Gervais in the bath special. <laughs> this being election day. <laughs> even PMs like to do it. And one of BPMs. <laughs> Scientists take selfie. Here's Bill Nye, the science guy, taking a selfie from a stage and tweeting it. So as I say, this selfie phenomena is really out of this world. Pardon the pun. I'm not even a dad, and these are dad jokes. So what's happened? It's not like some single invention has come along and changed the way we behave. In fact, the, the selfie phenomena has come out of a convergence of a number of different technologies, one of them certainly being the smartphone, and specifically those smartphones that had the camera in the front. Now, the designers of these things put the camera in so we could do video conferencing. That worked out well. <laughs> but then you couple the smartphone with internet sharing platforms, etc., and the selfie takes off. Once a few people start doing it, it becomes a meme, and the rest is history. Now, it's easy to be cynical and see all this taking funny pictures of yourself as narcissism on steroids. <laughs> but I think there is something positive from all this. <laughs> there is a positive in all this. And it's this. Can you remember what your grandmother looks like? Or your great-grandmother? Now, I can remember my grandma, I remember the great hair, but I have no idea what she looked like as a young woman. Now, this young lady here, while well, she might regret it, her great-great-grandchildren will remember what she looks like. <laughs> so, in a strange, twisted sense, this convergence of technology that have given us the selfie is documenting our lives in a different way than ever before. And the reason why I'm talking about this is because I think this process that has led to the selfie is something we can take handle of and use it to better engage the public with science move science from the ivory tower that it is into more of a participatory culture so that we can have citizens leading science. So not just citizen science, but citizens leading science. But I'll come to that in a moment. And interesting things happen over the last 15 to 20 years, the same sort of convergence in technology that gave us the selfie. We've seen similar things happen in wildlife research, my field. And now researchers around the world are capturing animal selfies. Not like this one. <laughs> more so like this. This is an animal selfie taken by what we refer to as an automatically triggered camera. They allow us to do wildlife without touching the animals. Here's an automatically triggered camera. They're a great piece of kit. Essentially, it's just a digital camera in a box. There's a sensor in there that triggers the camera when the animal jumps in front. Now, these are fantastic for 
us as researchers, myself as researchers, myself, that's plural, don't matter. For me as a researcher, this is great. <laughs> It gets us away from traditional methods of doing wildlife research. If we go back to the days of Darwin and Wallace, most research, or most wildlife research, was about collecting animals to send back to museums and zoos, to basically have collections of them. In fact, Alfred Russell Wallace funded, uh, funded many of his trips around the world by collecting animals, and this usually involved lethal forms of capture. When we go into the 20th century, however, people who wanted to start studying animals in the wild, they had to invent non-lethal forms or live trapping methods. These live trapping methods are great, but the problem is they're still quite invasive. So cameras allow us to get away from that. And they provide us a number of key advantages. One, certainly to the researcher, is getting away from this. <laughs> Working up close with animals can be dangerous. There's no doubt about that. So you get away from this to a situation where you can view the animal, it can do its business, and we're, it safe, uh, we're in a safe system of sitting at our home going through these photos. Now, the great thing about the photos is that I can then share this around to colleagues if I don't know what the animal is and they can identify it for me, rather than being in the wild and seeing an animal and not being able to guess or identify what it was. We also help the animals out. So we get away from this situation. These are pictures of fox paws, the injuries. The one on the right has a swollen paw, the other one's got a quite nasty cut. Now, these were caught in leg hold traps. The traps aren't designed to hurt the animal. They're supposed to be non-lethal but animals can still be injured. So we get away from that to allow the animal to conduct their own business. We don't interfere with them, except for maybe a little bit of a distraction from our bait. And they can go on and do their day. Now, this is especially relevant in the Australian context where many of our animals carry around babies in pouches or they forage together. Cages can separate foraging animals. So you have two potaroos, one at the top, and there's also one in the cage, and these were likely foraging together, and a cage trap separates that. So we get away from that. It allows the animal to do their own thing. But this bit of footage shows us something even more remarkable. This was captured by a colleague of mine who's a very experienced ecologist, and he said when he saw this, he was simply gobsmacked. So that's a baby potaroo. These sort of things have never been seen prior, even by very experienced wildlife ecologists, just because these animals hide. So these advantages that the camera trap has given us, they're allowing us to take us out of the picture so we're safe. It puts the animal in a much less invasive sense so we don't injure the animal. And also the pictures are quite remarkable. Are also advantages that we can take over and put down into the citizen science space. Now, if you're not sure what citizen science is, it's this. It's where we take members of the public out into the field and they can do science with us or for us. Bird watching communities have a long history of doing citizen science. And little wonder it's quite easy to do bird watching. So long as you know what species you're looking at, you can go and do some citizen science. But it doesn't go far enough. But I'll come to that in a second. The camera traps are allowing us to take citizen science with mammals and reptiles, something we've never been able to do prior. And I'll just mention a couple. One is called Instant Wild. This is ran by the Royal Zoological Society. You can get it as an app on your phone or you can access it online. Essentially, what's happening in the background, there's a number of camera trapping projects around the world and they feed their pictures into a database. So on your phone, you get a stream of pictures. Every couple of days, you get a new picture of an animal. You can then go in and identify what that animal was and participate in science. Now, this is great for the researchers. They love it because it means they don't have to go through and identify 50,000 pictures of zebras. And it's great for us as the citizens because we can see real science taking place and take part. One of the other great things about camera traps, they're really easy to work with. You don't need a lot of training. You put them on the ground and turn them on. Even I can do it. So some researchers in the US last year took advantage of this and did the Great Chicken Coop Stakeout. <laughs> This project was about looking at what types of urban predators are moving into the backyard environment. So they got 60 members of the public, interested volunteers, trained them how to use it, and off they went. Now, this citizen science project has generated a couple of scientific publications and has also resulted in a new project called eMammal. So these things are growing. Even in Australia, the Victorian government's been collaborating with community groups to work with camera traps and have these citizen science projects. But as I said, they just don't go far enough. Well, not far enough for me, anyway. If we want people as interested in science and the community of science as what they are in snapping a selfie or playing on YouTube or Facebook, then we need to change something. We need to go from the citizen science to citizens leading science. 
in that sense, we need to hand science over to the public. Now, if you're wondering if you're sitting next to a scientist, you'll probably know now they'll be muttering something about, you can't let the public have science. What are you talking about? <laughs> this is crazy. <laughs> so let me explain actually what I mean. When I mentioned about the, uh, the, about the selfies, they came together from a convergence of technology. And that's true, but I missed out a really important issue there. And that's the human condition. We love to share things. That's why selfies became what they are. It's the same thing that happened with YouTube. Video recording technology has been around for decades, and the internet's been around for a while. But it wasn't until the last few years that video recording technology got cheap enough, and then YouTube as a sharing platform came along. But in essence, the human need and desire to share things with others, that YouTube really took off. Now, of course, there's lots of videos of Charlie and cats, and they may waste a lot of time, but lots of good things have come out of it. Science communication, uh, lots of videos from universities, university lectures, or just general talks. I think even Charlie Lineweaver's on a few of those YouTube clips. And just simple things like movie reviews or video game reviews. In fact, it's where I first found TED. I'm sure many of you here consume this content. So it seems to me that if we want the public to be engaged in this space, in the scientific space and engaged in science, not just a topic, but science as a way of thinking, then we need to allow them to come in and ask their own questions and explore their own answers and come up with ways to solve those problems. We can't move them away from the situation as we have done for so long. So what can we do about it? Well, it seems to me there's three things we can do. One, if you're a scientist and you're really keen on if you're a non-scientist and you're really keen on doing science, well, then go and find a scientist. Say you're interested in what's happening in your backyard, what urban predators are happening, you want to replicate that same thing they did in the US, well, then find a scientist who will help you. After all, any citizen-led science program will still need a, science to, a scientist to do the science liaison bit. We still need ethics approvals. You still need people to make sure the analysis and the way things are done is correct. And if you're a scientist and someone is asking you about can they do a project, well, help them out and mentor them. And thirdly and importantly, and this is a bigger problem, science is really about publish or perish. And universities and funding bodies are really focused on that way of measuring the success of a scientist. And I think that needs to change. They need to start recognising the fact... <laughs> These funding bodies need to recognise work done outside of that very, very narrow way of measuring what scientists do. Now, I know it sounds much easier said than done, and I'm sure having citizen-led science projects are not meant to come to the detriment of any other science, or even citizen science, it would merely just be an add-on to what we already have. And not every citizen science project would be able to venture into all fields of science, despite Robert Downey Jr.'s documentary series, Iron Man. Despite that, <laughs> we're probably not going to have particle physics happening in the lounge room anytime soon. Now, I know it's, as I say, much easier said than done. Science is difficult. It's quite complicated. I'm doing a PhD myself. We spend years of time studying a very narrow field just so we can stand at the limits of our knowledge for a very short period of time. But I don't think that's the reason why we should be excluding the public from entering into that space. As we move into the 21st century, we face many problems which will require scientific solutions, of course, but they'll also require a public to understand not just the scientific topic, but the way that science is done. There's a reason why we've had a lot of drama in the last few years about whether the science is right or not. And that's because often a lot of people don't understand how it's actually done, rather than the topic itself. So we need to open the science up. We need to take science from the ivory tower and move it into a participatory culture so we can have citizen science and citizen-led science projects. Thank you. <laughs>